Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. The wife set herself up to cheat, but what did it turn into? Today's story with a similar plot. Enjoy watching it. While waiters and dishwashers attended to details, bustling around tables and tidying up dishes, Frank Walker sat alone at one end of the dining table. He observed other guests enjoying themselves, while some took breaks to stroll or make phone calls. Drinks and coffee were served, and the party continued, but Frank was absorbed in contemplation over an unexpected note left by an anonymous waiter. The note warned him of potential danger from Mark Lavalier, who, it was said, was attempting to steal his wife. The warning caught Frank off guard, and after rereading it several times, he noticed his wife once again on the dance floor with Lavalier. This raised concern, especially when they disappeared from view for the second time. Frank decided to intervene, but before he could stand up, the music ended, and he saw them leave the dance floor. Relieved by this, he returned to his seat, expecting Lavalier to bring his wife back. Instead, they headed to Mark's table, and Frank watched them, seeing them converse with him and his friends. Lavalier then left, and his wife, bidding farewell to Frank and expressing her love, headed to the restrooms. As Frank watched his wife move through the restaurant toward the hallway where the restrooms were located, Frank realized that there was something wrong with the way she said she was going to the restroom. What seemed strange was the way she stopped and told him that she loved him and would see him later. Her behavior was not that of someone going to the toilet, instead, she looked and acted like someone who was leaving to do something other than just go to the bathroom. Frank got up from the table and followed her. He had not taken more than a few steps when Lavalier and his two companions, as the note warned, rose from the table and intercepted him. Frank Walker made a living fixing situations for organizations. He worked for corporations, almost every week. He would board a plane and fly to some other country where he would clean up businesses and other types of organizations that had gone off the rails and found themselves in some upside-down administrative, operational, or financial situation. Almost every day, Frank dealt with selfish and domineering senior executives, officers, directors, and senior managers who achieved their positions through politics, bribery, lies, deceit, bullying, and intimidation. Almost every day, Frank had to deal with intransigent managers and executives who blackmailed and terrorized workers and prided themselves on being simply ruthless. When Frank entered these situations to make changes that impacted people's lives and livelihoods, he often encountered opposition, intimidation, and even threats. He was once threatened by a drug cartel because he was working on a project to move an American manufacturer from Mexico back to the States. Frank did not back down from the threats, and his client moved to Alabama. Frank was good at his job and excelled in situations where he was threatened. Most of all, he liked to fight selfish, power-hungry, ruthless, and dangerous people. Essentially, it was his game. So when Mark Lavalier, large and athletic but young and naive, and his comrades confronted him, it only took Frank a few moments to turn the situation around so that they were the ones who felt threatened. Never in their short, young lives had anyone explained the consequences of their actions to them the way Frank had and without a moment's hesitation. They stepped aside to let him pass. So now that Mark Lavalier's buddies were out of the way, Frank hurried after Brooke. And when he caught up with her, she was almost at the back exit of the restaurant and lounge. Brooke, he shouted. Either she didn't hear or ignored it, but she didn't stop and continued to walk towards the door. Frank quickened his pace, closed the distance between them, and called out again, Brooke, where are you going this time? Brooke stopped, turned to face her husband. She looked irritated and demanding as she asked Frank, What are you doing here? Frank looked at her and saw that there was something wrong with her behavior. She was cold to him and obviously annoyed that he caught up with her. I'll ask you the same thing. What are you doing here? He asked. Brooke thought for a few moments before answering, Frank, I want. But stopped mid-sentence. Frank looked into her eyes and asked again, where are you going, Brooke? Brooke looked away from Frank and thought, damn, this shouldn't have happened. He shouldn't be here. Frank. Brooke began to speak again but stopped because she needed to think about what she was going to tell him. She knew there was no point in lying. She had to tell him the truth. She must tell him where she is going. But it will be awkward for her and painful for Frank. Earlier that evening, Brooke met Mark Lavalier by chance. 
Returning from the toilet, she passed next to Mark's table. He noticed her, stood up from the table politely, stopped her, introduced himself, and engaged in small talk with her for a few moments. Brooke then continued to her table and joined Frank and the rest of the party. A little later, when the party was in full swing, the music group came out and began their first session of the evening. Then, shortly after the band began playing, Mark Lavalier walked up to the guest's table. Of course, everyone was delighted that a local football player and sports celebrity had stopped by. He was friendly, introduced himself, shook hands with everyone in the party, took a few selfies, and signed a few autographs. And then asked Brooke to dance. Brooke was shocked and turned him down, but Mark was gentlemanly persistent. The other partygoers encouraged her, and Frank didn't say no, so she reluctantly accepted his invitation. Needless to say, Brooke was apprehensive as Mark led her from the party to the dance floor. But once on the dance floor, Brooke discovered that dancing with Mark was an experience she could never have imagined. He was young, handsome, courageous, a professional athlete, and knew how to dance. And while she danced with Mark, he touched her the way she loved to be touched, he held her the way she liked to be held. He spoke to her the way she liked to be spoken to, he said what she liked to hear. Mark won her over, and she never again refused his invitations to join him on the dance floor. And as the evening went on, after dancing a few times and becoming more comfortable with each other, her attraction to him grew stronger, and it was unmistakably a sensual attraction. Then, at the end of the evening, there came a moment when he led them across the dance floor into the shade. There, he embraced her, kissed her, caressed her, and expressed his desire for her. He suggested they retire to his home for privacy and comfort, where they could explore each other without inhibition. He vividly described to her how they would spend a night together, enhancing their sensual experiences. It would be a memorable encounter, one she would carry with her always. Brooke found herself captivated, and as she dined with Frank and other guests, she contemplated Mark's proposition. She felt conflicted about leaving Frank and the party to accompany a near stranger to his home, but the excitement of being with Mark sent shivers down her spine. She realized she desired him, a departure from her fidelity to Frank. Though she had been attracted to other men before, it had never progressed beyond mere attraction. Tonight was different. Tonight, she craved Mark's touch, and she wanted to indulge in the experience. Yet, she grappled with the guilt of betraying Frank's trust and vows. To justify her actions, Brooke sought a compelling rationale, one she could reconcile with her conscience and hope Frank would understand. She decided to go with Mark because he was extraordinary. Not only was he a professional athlete and a local celebrity, but he also possessed charm and gallantry that captivated her. Mark represented the epitome of a romantic fantasy, and he was offering Brooke an opportunity she couldn't resist. She believed Frank would see it as a unique experience for her and would accept her choice to explore this connection with Mark, just this once. Naturally, he'll be upset, but he'll understand because he's not just her husband. He's her closest confidant and companion, wanting her to embrace this unique opportunity with Mark. Brooke found comfort in these thoughts. She now had a rationale she could justify to herself and hopefully, to Frank as well. Yet, deep down, she acknowledged that her decision to go with Mark stemmed from his assertive declaration that she belonged to him for the night, igniting a primal desire within her that she couldn't ignore. She resolved not to let go of such a thrilling experience, reminding herself that aside from being Frank's wife, she was also a woman with needs and desires. With her mind made up, as the birthday dinner concluded and the group returned to the hall for more festivities, Mark approached their table, inviting Brooke to dance once more. Frank, visibly irritated, objected to Mark's persistent requests for his wife's company. Brooke skillfully deflected her husband's protests, agreeing to one last dance with Mark, citing her fondness for the music. Graciously, Mark thanked Frank for his understanding before leading Brooke back to the dance floor's dim recesses. In the shadows, Mark inquired if Brooke was ready to depart. She affirmed with a laugh, acknowledging her surrender to him. Without resistance, Brooke allowed Mark to explore her intimately beneath her cocktail dress. As the dance concluded, Mark guided her to their table, outlining his plan for their departure. He assured her of her safety and promised to handle any concerns Frank might raise. Trusting his words, Brooke stood at the back exit, prepared to leave with him. 
However, their exit strategy faltered as Frank unexpectedly appeared at the back exit, indicating a hitch in Mark's plan. He stopped her on the way out and demanded an explanation. Brooke, I'm waiting. Tell me where you're going, Frank told her. Brooke gathered as much confidence as she could and said, Frank, I'm going with Mark. Are you going with Mark Lavalier? Frank asked, showing no emotion. Yes, I'm going with Mark. He invited me to go with him to his house, she said. Frank remained calm. Should I go with him to his home? Why are you going to his house? Frank walked around her and stood between Brooke and the door. Frank, this is too complicated to explain right now. I'll call or text you later and explain exactly what I'm doing, but for now, I have to go. Mark is waiting for me now. Please let me pass, she said. Frank continued to remain calm. No, Brooke, I won't let you pass me by, and I don't want you to call or text me later. I want you to explain to me what you are going to do right here and now, he said. Brooke moaned, oh God, Frank, please, please don't make a scandal out of this. Just let me go, and I'll explain everything later, she told him. No, Brooke, I want you to tell me right now what you are going to do, Frank demanded in a raised voice. Upon hearing Frank's demand, Brooke became confrontational. Frank, you are not my commander, so get out of the way and let me pass, she shouted back. No, Brooke, you are my wife, and you are not going anywhere until you tell me what you are going to do, Frank shouted back. Realizing that Frank wouldn't let her leave, Brooke realized that she would have to tell him why she was leaving and what she was going to do. So she sighed in nervous frustration and began to speak. Frank, uh, I know this sounds terrible, and uh, honestly, I can't believe I'm doing this, but I'm going home with Mark and spending the night, and quickly added. But, Frank, this is only for today, and tomorrow he will bring me home. Frank didn't immediately respond to Brooke's words. It took him a few moments to realize that his wife had just told him that she was going to spend the night with Lavalier. But he collected his thoughts and angrily answered her, No, Brooke, you will not spend the night with Lavalier. You're not going to the sleepover, are you? You're planning to be intimate with him, aren't you? Frank interjected. Brooke avoided his gaze, remaining silent. Tell me the truth, Brooke. Is that your intention? Frank pressed, but Brooke remained wordless, her gaze fixed on the floor. Brooke, I know I'm right, he insisted. Brooke finally responded, Yes, Frank, you're right. I'm going to be intimate with Mark, she confessed. There was silence in the corridor. Finally, Brooke looked up and saw the puzzled look on her husband's face. Frank, Frank, what are you thinking? Frank Walker was a man who was not easily surprised and certainly not easily shocked, but what his wife had just told him shook him to the core. Even after reading the note that warned him that this would happen, and just for a moment, he lost his composure. What am I thinking about? I'll tell you what I'm thinking, Brooke. I think that this is simply incredible, just crazy, that's what I'm thinking about, he shouted to her. Brooke was taken aback by Frank's uncharacteristic outburst. She had never seen such of anger from Frank in all their time together, and she was scared. Oh God, Frank, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Brooke said, still looking at the floor. She couldn't bring herself to look him in the eye. Frank regained his composure. Why, Brooke? Why are you doing this? Frank demanded. Frank, Frank. I know this will seem crazy to you, but just listen, she said. I'm listening, he said. Frank, probably every woman dreams of a romantic experience with a celebrity or someone rich and famous, Frank interrupted her, saying sarcastically, let me guess. Mark Lavalier is your prince charming from fairy tales, or he's your knight in shining armor, please, Frank, don't laugh at this, come on, Brooke. Tell me the continuation of this tale. Frank, this is every woman's dream. Mark is not just any guy, he is a special kind of man. He is a real man, a star, and a celebrity. I want to experience what every woman dreams of, so please, Frank, please show me that you love me and that you won't mind me experiencing this, she begged her husband. Frank tried to control his emotions and cope with an incredible situation. All right, so tonight you'll go to Lavalier's place, be intimate with him, and tomorrow he'll bring you back home. Then, we'll just carry on as a happily married couple, as if this encounter never occurred. 
Is that what you're telling me, Brooke? Frank asked. This is not an affair, it's just one night, and yes, tomorrow I'll be home, and my dream will come true, and I will be happy. And you will be happy that you supported me and allowed me to have this experience, and we will move on, she answered. She hoped that Frank believed what she was telling him, but when she looked at him, he rolled his eyes and looked at her in a way that she couldn't believe what she was saying. Seeing the look on his face, Brooke realized that things weren't going as she had imagined. So you cast me aside to be intimate with your charming prince who is far superior to me. He said. Damn, Brooke, it really hurts. Are you saying that I'm not special? Are you saying that I'm not a real man? No, no, no. I didn't say that, and I didn't mean that, she exclaimed in panic. Well, Brooke, then what did you mean? He asked her. Frank, you are special, you are a real man, but Frank interrupted her. But I'm not a professional athlete and celebrity who supposedly knows the secret to pleasing a woman sexually, is that what you're saying, Brooke? Brooke looked at the floor. There's more to it, she said. Then what's the matter, are you tired of me? No, 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 Frank, you are the best, but Frank interrupted her again. I'm the best, but you still need someone else, he said. Yes, she said, looking at the floor. So tonight, you realize that the person you desire is Mark Lavalier, she admitted, still avoiding his gaze. So you're choosing to be with Mark Lavalier, indulging in a passionate night of intimacy. It's not about love. I don't love him, but yes, I'm choosing to be intimate with him and experience something many women fantasize about, she declared with resolve and confidence. However, she quickly added, Frank, I'm not giving up on us. You're my husband, and I'll never give up on us. But tonight, I won't be with you, I'll be with Mark. I hope, no, I plead with you, please understand my feelings and needs. Please, Frank, I beg you, let's not turn this into a scene, she pleaded. Frank took a deep breath. Why, Brooke? What makes you think that I can agree with you having sex with another man and then coming back to me like it's no big deal, he asked. Because you always treated me with an open heart, and you always treated my emotions, feelings, and needs with understanding and attention. And I hope that when you realize how special this night with Mark is for me, you will control your anger and handle it like a sane, experienced, sophisticated person, she told her husband. Can I handle it? Can I handle it? Please explain to me how I should cope with the fact that tonight you will be in Mark Lavalier's bed, and he will take you. How can I handle tomorrow when he pulls up with you in his car, and I find out that you two were intimate, not just once, but all night? How can I look at you knowing that you have given yourself to another man? Tell me, how should I feel about all this? He asked. Frank, I can't answer this question. I just hope you can sort this out in your mind, and we can move on with our lives. I know you're angry at me. But can't you understand how important this experience is for me? She asked. Brooke, what you're saying is that you're hoping I'll just suck it up and accept your affair with Lavalier, Frank said. This is not an affair, she screamed. And no, Frank, I don't want you to just accept it. I ask you to consider my feelings and my needs and come to terms with it because you love me and because you are my best friend, my soulmate. And you want me to have this special experience, an experience I may never have again. Frank, this is what I want from you, honey, she told him. Frank pondered Brooke's request for a moment. He couldn't fathom how she expected him to be okay with her being intimate with Lavalier. The more he thought about it, the more evident it became that she didn't grasp the gravity of the situation and its impact on him and their relationship. It seemed she was caught up in a delusion fueled by her interactions with Lavalier during the evening. He felt the need to bring her back to reality. Brooke, what do you call a man whose wife sleeps with another man? He inquired. After a moment's reflection, Brooke responded, a cuckold. She struggled to pronounce the word. That's correct, Brooke. They call him a cuckold, a man whose wife is with another man for pleasure. But I won't become a cuckold because of you and Mark Lavalier, he asserted firmly. Tears welled up in Brooke's eyes as she looked at Frank. So, you won't stop me? She questioned. No, Brooke, I won't intervene. You're an adult, capable of making your own decisions. Whether you choose to do this or not is up to you. If this is what you feel you need, then go ahead. 
spend the night with him, indulge in love and intimacy. I won't hinder you, Frank interjected. I've already told you, this isn't love. I don't love him. I love you, Frank. It's just physical attraction. I'm drawn to Mark sexually, not romantically, Brooke protested. So, you're separating love and sex in your mind? Frank inquired. Yes, Frank. I'll be with Mark because of physical attraction, but I'll come back to you because of love. You're my husband, my best friend, my soulmate. We share more than just physical intimacy, she assured him. I won't debate the distinction between love and sex with you. But as I said, I won't stand in your way, Frank reiterated. Brooke looked at Frank, wondering if he truly accepted it. Brooke, if this is what you want, go for it. But, Frank paused, before you leave, we'll end our marriage. Right now. Brooke panicked. End our marriage? What do you mean? I mean, once you walk out that door, we're no longer married. We'll remove our rings and dissolve our alliance. We'll deal with the legalities later. But in my understanding, our marriage ends before you leave, Frank explained. Before Brooke could respond, Frank continued, And tonight, when Lavalier takes you, I will be a cuckold because you won't be my wife. No, no, no. I can't do this, Frank. I can't. Brooke screamed. No? We've reached an agreement, Brooke. So what's your decision? He pressed. I don't know, she said wearily. Nonsense. You know exactly what you want. You want to have it both ways. Spend the night with Mark Lavalier and then come back to me, Frank accused. Brooke sobbed uncontrollably. Are you serious? If I go out with Mark for one night, will you divorce me? She asked, her voice trembling. Yes, he said completely seriously. Brooke's mood suddenly changed from panic to anger as she saw her reasoning for spending the night with Mark Cromwell right before her eyes. Frank, do my feelings and emotions really mean so little to you that you will simply automatically dissolve our marriage? Because of this and not even give us a chance to sort it out and move on together? She asked. Brooke, there's nothing to deal with here. Look, understand, there are some things in life that are non-negotiable, and my wife having sex with another man is one of them. I won't agree to a deal where you have sex with Lavalier, and then you come home, and we just carry on with our lives as if it's no big deal, he said. So my feelings, emotions, and needs don't mean anything to you, she said sarcastically. Brooke, just a few minutes ago, you walked away and abandoned me, basically threw me aside and without any explanation. If I hadn't caught up and stopped you, you'd now be in Mark Lavalier's car driving to his house for a night of sex. So obviously, my feelings and emotions don't mean much to you. So why should your feelings and emotions mean anything to me? He asked her. The reality of her decision finally hit Brooke. Oh my God, Frank, I am so sorry. I just didn't think, she exclaimed. Damn it, Brooke, don't say you didn't think because you did. But all I was thinking about was getting knocked for Laval and all the sexy things he was going to do to you, Frank started. And you certainly didn't think about me and that I was interested in why you left, where you went, and what you would do, he told her. Oh God, Frank, please believe me, I didn't mean to leave you without letting you know where I went. When I got to Mark's house, I was going to write to you and explain where I am and what I'm doing, she said. Write to me? Seriously? Frank chuckled. So, you're telling me that while you're in bed having sex with Lavalier, you plan to write to me? And what exactly were you going to write, Frank? I regret leaving the party, but I decided to go to Mark Lavalier's place for some intimate time, so I won't be coming home. Good night and see you tomorrow? Frank mocked sarcastically. This is cruel, Brooke, he said. Cruel? Brooke, it's cruel and shocking that you made a split-second decision to leave me, your husband your best friend, and your soulmate, to spend the night with a man you just met, Frank told her. Brooke cried, and what's really cruel is that you expected me to put up with it as if this is no big deal. That's cruel, Frank, she exclaimed. I'm so sorry, Frank, sorry. I just didn't think, she said. Well, Brooke, it doesn't matter now what you thought or didn't think. And it doesn't matter what you write or don't write because I caught up with you before you walked out the door and now I know your intentions. 
and now you know my intentions. None of us need to guess anymore, now we just need to get to the point, Frank looked at her firmly. Brooke looked at Frank with a questioning expression on her face. And what is this? What is the essence of the matter? She asked. The point is this, here's the door, and Lavalier is waiting for you outside. I imagine he's starting to lose patience. This is your decision, Frank firmly told his wife of 12 years. Brooke didn't hesitate for a second. Frank, I'm not going out that door. I'm not going to leave you for him. I'm not going to give up our life together for his sake. I'm not that stupid, Brooke told him. Frank studied her. Well, 15 minutes ago, you were determined to walk out that door and go with him. So what has changed? Or has anything changed other than the fact that you don't want to get a divorce, of course? Frank asked. Well, I mean, can I believe that your frantic desire to have sex with Lavalier has suddenly disappeared? Or are you going to wait until next week when I'm in Europe and then sleep with him? He asked. No. Why do you think so? Brooke screamed. Are you going to cheat on me behind my back? He asked. No, no, no. I never cheated on you. I would never cheat on you. I love you, she shouted. Well, just tonight you were going to cheat on me. If I hadn't stopped you, you would have cheated on me right now for the second time in just a few minutes, Frank said. Reality hit Brooke right between the eyes, and she found herself face to face with what she had decided to do to Mark. Oh my god, no, no, no. What was I thinking, she shouted. So what happened, he asked. I'm not sure, Frank. I'm utterly confused. I don't understand how I could have thought I could go with Mark and it wouldn't be wrong, and that you wouldn't be upset, she confessed. Frank listened, but she noticed his skeptical expression. She knew she had to be completely honest with him. Frank, I truly don't know what came over me. It all began when Mark approached our table and asked me to dance, pulling me onto the dance floor. He was so assertive and forward. He kept telling me how much he desired me and how pleasurable it would be to be with him intimately. Then he started holding me tightly, then he kissed me, then he began touching me, and Frank, I didn't resist. I didn't stop him, she said, tears streaming down her face. So you encouraged him, Frank said. Yes, yes, I encouraged him. I'm so sorry, Frank, she cried. Then I convinced myself that going with him was the right thing to do. And then I convinced myself that you would understand and wouldn't mind if I went with him. All I can say is that I realize I really messed up, and I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, she cried. Frank listened to Brooke and at the same time thought about the note the waiter gave him. Frank reached into his pocket and pulled it out. Here, read this, he said. Brooke took the note, read it, and then looked at Frank. Where did you get it? Is she real? she asked. The waiter slipped it to me during dinner, he told her. Is this just a game he plays? asked Brooke. That's what it says here, Brooke was incredulous after reading the note. I can't believe it, I just can't believe it, she said. Brooke, can you believe it? He picked you out of the crowd and actually seduced you, he manipulated you and fooled you, Frank said. Brooke continued to read the note over and over again. What he did to me was just a game? she asked. Yes, everything he told me just a game, Frank affirmed. Brooke was destroyed. It began to dawn on her that she was simply the prize for this week's game, a female trophy specimen to satisfy Lavalier's sexual appetite for married women. Last week it could have been a woman named Debbie, the next one is a woman named Sandy, but this week it's Brooke. It was she who took the bait and fell for Mark's game, and she felt a sickening feeling as she realized that she had put her marriage at risk. Frank, I'm sick, she said turned and ran away from him to the toilet. She vomited several times and then went to the sink to wash her hands and face. Looking at herself in the mirror, she saw that she was in complete disarray, just like this whole damn evening. Brooke came out of the restroom and saw Frank still standing in front of the exit. She rushed to him and hugged him. Oh God, Frank, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Forgive me for being so stupid and gullible, she asked through tears. Frank looked at her and then said, Brooke, Lavalier took you by surprise. Then he seduced you to the point where you believed you could have sex with him and there would be no consequences. 
that I wouldn't mind if you had a one-night stand with him. But now you have found out the opposite, now you know. So promise us that we will never be in this situation again. On his way to the door, Frank noticed that two of Lavalier's teammates were still sitting. They watched him and Brooke. Brooke, wait here. I need to talk to Lavalier's friends, Frank said. Please, give it up. We don't need any more trouble, Brooke told Frank. No, Brooke, I'm not going to leave us just like that. And with that, Frank left Brooke standing alone and walked over to Lavalier's teammates. Sir, we don't want any problems, one of his teammates said. Okay, then do what I tell you. Tell your buddy Lavalier that he lost the game today. Tell him he is a loser. Tell him Frank Walker is going to spread the word around the world that Mark Lavalier is a loser. Both of Lavalier's teammates stare at Frank with stunned expressions. Sir, we can't tell him this. He'll kill us both, one of them said. Gentlemen, do you want to deal with me or him? Frank asked them. Sir, we don't want any problems with you, one said. Good choice. Now one of you will take the phone and tell him what I said. Do it now. And tell him that when I go out that door, it's better for him not to show up anywhere. One of the men picked up the phone, dialed Lavalier's number, and told him what Frank had said. Frank couldn't hear the conversation. But he realized that Lavalier was beside himself with anger because his friend told him not to do anything stupid, and then the call stopped. What did he say? Frank asked. He said he would kill you, one of the men answered. Okay, Frank answered. Oh God, Frank, I promise you that after all this, I will never let a man near me again, she said. Frank looked at her for a moment and then said, Okay, and when we go out like we did tonight, I'll try to help you keep that promise. I should have intervened before Lavalier got you into this state, but I didn't do it, so this is my fault just like yours. And it's also Lavalier's fault because he shouldn't have sought out and seduced married women. So, Brooke, I forgive you and myself, but I don't forgive Lavalier, and I'll deal with him later. Oh God, Frank, thank you for your understanding. But Frank, please, just forget Mark. We'll never see him again, and he's not worth the trouble you might face, she said. After this remark, Frank looked at Brooke and thought it was strange that she didn't want Mark to suffer any consequences. In the end, Lavalier almost robbed Brooke of her marriage. Why wouldn't she want him to feel some discomfort for trapping her in his game? I'll think about it, he told her. Frank then asked, do you want to go back to the party? No, Frank, let's go home, Brooke exclaimed. Sure, yes, please let's just go home, Brooke continued. Frank and Brooke walked back down the hallway and entered the restaurant, and with that, Frank left. His two teammates picked up Brooke and they left the restaurant and the lounge. On the street, Frank gave the parking ticket to the valet, and then they, along with several other couples, waited for their car to be picked up. While they were waiting, an SUV roared up to them, breaking in front of them, and the passenger side window rolled down. An angry Mark Lavalier sat inside the SUV. Come on, Brooke, you said you wanted to come with me, so come on, get in the car, Mark shouted. She won't go with you, Lavalier, Frank told him. I'm not talking to you, old man, Mark shouted back to Frank. Come on, Brooke, let's go now, Mark continued to insist. No, Mark, I can't go with you tonight, Brooke answered him. Brooke, come here and get in the car, let's go now, Mark, Brooke shouted. She won't go with you. You lost the game, you're a loser, now get out of here, loser, and leave us alone, Frank told Mark. Being told he was a loser in front of a group of people who were most likely his fans instantly infuriated Mark. I'll show you who the loser is, you piece of. Mark shouted, getting out of his SUV. Frank asked the people waiting for their cars to move away because the situation could become dangerous. He then moved toward the front of the SUV on the driver's side, where he encountered Lavalier brandishing a large semi-automatic handgun. Lavalier was beside himself with rage. He lost Brooke, and now he's been publicly humiliated. Frank studied Lavalier, and his behavior reminded him of a scene in the Maasai Mara in Kenya when he watched a lion and hyenas fight over the lion's prey. Like that lion, Lavalier stalked Brooke for hours and then took over her body, mind, and soul. She belonged to him, and he was going to take her to his house to devour her for his sexual pleasure. 
But before that happened, Frank intervened and snatched her from him. Now Lavalier, like a lion, had only one thing on his mind, to get her back, and he did not care what he had to do to achieve this, even if it meant killing Frank Walker. Brooke will come with me, and if you try to stop her, I will kill you. Lavalier shouted. Frank took a few steps back and was now standing no more than three meters from Mark. His arms were raised, palms up, and his fingers extended in a non-aggressive, non-escalatory, but self-defensive manner. Put the gun down, Frank said. Old man, you ruin my game, and I'll kill you. Put the gun down before you get into more trouble, Frank said in a calm, firm voice. I'll show you who's in trouble, old man. I'll kill you, and then I'll your wife. Mark shouted and pointed the gun in Frank's direction. Lavalier was so engrossed in his ranting and rage that he didn't notice Frank lower his right hand and put it in his pants pocket. In this pocket, Frank carried a Sig Sauer micro-compact semi-automatic pistol. It was loaded with eight rounds of Hornady critical defense ammunition, one cartridge was in the chamber, and seven cartridges were in the magazine. Frank was licensed to carry a SIG pistol and regularly trained to use it in self-defense situations like the one he was in now. Frank hadn't had to shoot a person in years, but when he was in the military, he saw action and actually killed several people, both with a pistol and at close range. So now, faced with an armed and aggressive Mark Lavalier, the memories of that experience came flooding back to him. And he instinctively knew how he needed to act in this life-threatening situation. Therefore, with his hand in his pocket, Frank decided that he would now end this confrontation, and he decided that he would shoot Lavalier. His rage, death threats, gun pointing, and proximity to Frank created a situation that justified the decision to shoot to kill. Having made this decision, Frank quieted down Lavalier's ranting and rage, he calmed down and controlled his breathing, he focused on what he had to do. Smoothly, he removed the pistol from his pocket, raised it to the firing position, aimed at Lavalier, and quickly fired two accurate shots. All movements of the pistol had to be precise, and the entire process had to be completed in less than three seconds, otherwise. Lavalier would likely return fire, and they would end up in a firefight, something Frank wanted to avoid. Focusing his gaze on Lavalier, Frank pulled a pistol from his pocket. It was a smooth extraction, just what he needed. But just as he was raising the gun to the firing position, three quick shots rang out behind Frank, to the right. At the same instant, Frank saw Lavalier's body shake as the bullets hit him, and then he saw Lavalier collapse to the ground. Having recovered from the unexpected shots, Frank thought, what the hell, and turning around, saw that the shooter was still aiming his pistol at Mark's body lying on the ground. Frank quickly pulled himself together and addressed the shooter. I think you did it. You can put the gun down, Frank said. He was going to kill you, the shooter said, lowering the gun to her side. Yes, that's what he said, Frank answered, and then asked, who are you? I'm an off-duty cop, and I work security here, the shooter told him as they quickly approached Lavalier. Oh, good. Well, I'm glad you're here, Frank said. Yes, I'm glad I'm here too, she said. Frank and the security officer knelt next to Lavalier, who was alive and conscious but groaning in pain from three gunshot wounds. What's happened? Mark moaned. They shot at you. Lie still, Frank told him. Did they shoot me? Mark asked. Yes, you were shot, Frank said. Who shot at me? Mark asked. I shot at you, Mark, the officer told him. Mark looked at the officer. Marjorie, he said. Yes, Mark, she said. Oh my gosh, Marjorie, why? Why did you shoot me? Lavalier asked breathlessly. Because you were going to kill this man, Marjorie told him. Mark was breathing heavily and losing blood. Oh God, I'm in so much pain. Please help me. I called the ambulance, doctors. They're already on their way. Stay still and hold on, Marjorie told him. Lavalier was breathing heavily. I didn't mean to kill him. It's just a game, Mark said, gasping for air. Pointing a gun and threatening a person is not a game, Marguerite told him. Marguerite, you know this is a game, he told her in a weak voice. Mark, how many times have I told you that your game will lead to you being killed, she said in response. 
I know, but it's just a game. I was just playing a game, he gasped. Oh God, I'm so cold. Why am I so cold? Then he looked at Frank and said, Please sir, I'm so thirsty. Please bring me some water. Frank turned and shouted to the audience to bring water for Lavalier. Lavalier was bleeding quickly, and Frank knew that even if the paramedics arrived right away, there was nothing they could do to save him because he had already lost too much blood. For a few more moments, Lavalier continued to beg for help but then fell silent. He was unconscious from the loss of blood. Then, after a few more minutes, his breathing stopped. Frank checked for a pulse, checked again, but there was none. He was no longer there. Mark Lavalier had died. It was already well after 11.30 at night when the police allowed Frank and Brooke to leave the restaurant and lounge. They and other witnesses to the confrontation and shooting were interviewed by police officers, detectives, special investigators, internal affairs officers, and even an assistant district attorney. Frank and Brooke testified about their contacts and involvement in Mark Lavalier's affairs. And Frank issued a separate statement supporting the off-duty police officer's decision to shoot Lavalier and went on record saying she saved his life. But finally, after an evening that started with simply attending a birthday party and ended with them being involved in the murder of a local sports star, Frank and Brooke were returning home. They rode in silence for some time, neither of them uttered a word. Finally, Brooke broke the silence. Frank, she said. Yes, he answered. Are you disappointed that you didn't kill him? She asked without a moment's hesitation. Yes, Frank answered. Brooke thought about his answer and how his reaction was immediate and unconditional, and she heard the anger in his voice. Frank was denied satisfaction and was angry that the situation with Lavalier ended with a female security officer committing the murder when Mark confronted them in front of the restaurant. Brooke knew without a doubt that this was now Frank Walker's game, and she knew that most likely it would not end well for Mark Lavalier. Mark was a young star with a huge ego, a fiery temper, and a gun, whereas Frank Walker was a seasoned corporate operative who made his living by taking down powerful men and women. And he was furious that this grown man playing children's games had the audacity to try to steal his wife right in front of him. And Lavalier could not escape the consequences. Brooke was well aware that Frank was armed and knew that he had deliberately lured Mark into a situation where he would most likely kill him. Telling Mark that he had lost the game and calling him a loser was nothing more than bait, and of course, Mark fell for it, which sealed his fate. So either way, Brooke knew Mark Lavalier was a dead man before he even got out of his SUV. And watching the confrontation between her potential lover and her husband, she was very upset because she was the one who caused Mark's death. If he had not chosen her and if she had not agreed to go with him, he would still be alive. But for some strange reason, fate intervened, and an off-duty officer shot and killed Lavalier innocently thinking he was saving Frank's life, but instead, denying Frank the opportunity to make Lavalier face punishment for trying to steal his wife. But she also saved Brooke from having to live with the knowledge that her husband killed Mark because of her. Well, I'm glad you didn't kill him, she told him. Why? Frank asked her. Because it was better that the officer killed him, she said. You mean with the police? Frank asked. Yes, and with the media, she said. Yes, if I had killed him, the police and the media would have tried to make a dirty story out of it, but it would have been a clear case of self-defense. He behaved inappropriately, he had a gun and pointed it at me, he threatened to kill me more than once. And he was only three meters away from me so it would be a justifiable situation for self-defense, shoot to kill, whether the police and the media like it or not, he told her. Yes, but the media would ask questions and analyze why you killed him and not wounded him, she answered. Of course, it's their job to ask questions, make guesses, and express critical opinions. But the fact is that he was armed with a deadly weapon and could have killed me even if he had been wounded. Therefore, for my own protection, self-defense, I would have no choice but to go for the stopping blow, he replied. Oh, she said, thinking about what he had told her. It will still be unpleasant in the media even if I didn't kill him. Some of the blame will be placed on me, Frank told her. And they will put it on me, she said. Yes, they will. So be prepared for the fact that they will come for us. 
Our lawyer will help up to a certain point, but only up to a certain point. You can be sure that the media will twist everything so that he was killed precisely because of you and me. There may be lawsuits and counterclaims, but don't worry, we can handle it, and we will emerge victorious because in the end, he seduced you, attacked us, and threatened me, so we are victims, Frank told her. Then he added, but remember, he was a football star and a local celebrity. And here in our beloved South, football stars are considered gods. So according to the media, he is not guilty of anything. So just understand that for the next few days, all we will see and hear in the media is that poor, poor Mark Lavalier is dead. It will be reported that he was dancing with a woman and her jealous husband created a situation that resulted in him being killed by a guard. But eventually, the real Mark Lavalier story will come out, and the media will calm down because they won't be interested in telling a story. About a sports hero who has a hobby of picking up married women and taking them to his home for the night for sex. That's what I want. I want it all to just go away, she said. It will happen eventually, Frank said. They drove in silence for a few more minutes, and then Frank asked, Are you disappointed that you didn't go and have a night of fabulous sex with him? Brooke was surprised and stunned by Frank's question. She glanced at him. How dare you ask such a thing? And began to say something but then paused, thinking for a few moments about how to answer his question. Then, in an expressive voice, she said, No, dear, of course not. This was the lie Frank expected to hear. A simple no would have been sufficient and believable, but the long pause and the dear, combined with of course not, were too serious and confirmed what he suspected, namely that she was thinking about the loss of her fairy tale experience and wanted to hide his disappointment from him. But the way she looked at him, her voice, and her choice of words gave her away. But Frank was not surprised because he knew that Lavalier had awakened in Brooke the idea that she was more than a wife, that she was a woman, and that it was her right to indulge in sex with a man who was not her husband. While they danced, Lavalier talked to Brooke about sexual things that usually go unspoken even between husband and wife. Brooke listened, and what he said sparked her imagination, and Lavalier convinced her that the ideal way to experience these unspeakable things was with a partner with whom she could be completely free, open, and uninhibited. A partner with whom she has no emotional ties. A partner who knows the ways of debauchery and guides her in exploring the erotic side of her sexuality. So the seed of infidelity had been sown, and Frank knew it. He knew she was now open to sex with other men, although she had previously promised that she would never let a man near her again. It was just a workaround to get out of the situation she was in when Frank stopped her from leaving with Lavalier. He detected it in her tone and observed it in her demeanor. Her actions conveyed a desire to explore intimacy with someone else. She simply wasn't prepared to act on it at the moment. But that's just for now. Knowing all this, Frank realized that he could never trust her again. And as they drove home, he wondered if he could live with his mistrust of her and accept the fact that one day she would have the opportunity to go with another man. And Brooke would most likely take advantage of this opportunity. What do you think of today's story? In my opinion, it's not the wife's fault. She was hypnotized like the previous women. What's your opinion? Write in the comments. See you in the next video.